final speaker of our day today uh, is the 2016 Kurt Hahn Award recipient for, from OBUSA. Tom James is the provost and dean at Columbia University's Teacher College in New York City. He is an alumnus of an Outward Bound course in the Utah Canyonlands in the 70s. He is a historian, an educator, and has long studied Kurt Hahn and his educational philosophy. Tom has written many articles and essays. He suggests that if you are going to read just one, you read The Only Mountain Worth Climbing. And this is what was shared about Tom at the national dinner in New York City about uh, three days ago, or, or two weeks ago, sorry, two weeks ago. Um, it's the end of a long day. <laughs> um, from the words of Laura Kohler, who is the board chair of the uh, Outward Bound USA National Board. We thank Tom for a life's dedication to the ideals of Kurt Hahn. Through Tom's writings, research, and teaching, he lifts high the belief of Kurt Hahn that our society can be better than we are and that each of us has more in us than we know and that experiential education can ignite a passion for learning. Outward Bound has been enriched immeasurably by the service of this educator who exemplifies the values held to be integral by our founder. It's with great pleasure that I introduce to all of you a wonderful friend of Outward Bound for more than 40 years, Tom James. So the only thing standing between you and dinner is me. <laughs> so I, I realize you're at the end of the day and they, they did some disastrous programming by uh, putting an academic at the end of the day. <laughs> so. I understand that. Um, I love being with this group and, and soaking in what you are doing in different parts of the world with Outward Bound. I've, I've watched and learned from Outward Bound over so many years. Um, I've worked with people in the United States, but also visited other places. And I have, um, just thinking about when um, Christina Fitzpatrick was talking earlier about the passion for development and fundraising and you know what it takes to to really take a team forward um, i see that in your work and i think the part of that that i feel you know as a historian and someone who teaches history and philosophy of education is that there's a very deep power in this work that's a coherent um, integrated set of values and we try to define it we can never come up with a catechism you know we can't have three words or five words but we all know it's there. And it's the mystery that really um, unites us. You know, it's like when they clang that bell um, on the ship and you know, you know that everybody's moving together. And that's there and I resonate to that and I've, I share that with you. Um, when I think about the, the arc of Kurt Hahn's life, you know, Kurt Hahn is out there in history. And as um, Ian was saying this morning, we need to look forward you know, but when you look forward, um, you're also embodying something. You know, if you want to look forward and think about democracy, um, you're going to need to have a sense of what that has been and what it was, or science and the practice of science and, the, you know, seeking truth and that sort of thing. So I don't think we should go back and create a catechism. And I don't think it's necessary for everyone to, you know, become, uh, you know, deeply immersed in the life of Kurt Hahn. But there are pieces of it um, that you're going to come into contact with. Um, there are parts of it that people in this group um, have lived and carried as they heard it from others. And I, as a historian, have studied it and thought about Han. And so I'm just going to say um, a couple of things, and it's going to be sort of two um, little bits of reasoning, um, sort of different from each other. And then I'm hoping maybe we can just talk a little bit. Because as uh, John was saying this morning, this is also about particip participation. We're a crew, we're not passengers, you know, to pick up one of the seven laws of Salem, of Han. So this man started a school in 1919. In English, we say Salem School. Um, now it's a cluster of schools. 
um, carried forward um, to leave. Um, and at Salem, there was a fire brigade. There was a rescue activity. There were expeditions. There were projects. Um, he said to his students that you need to learn from people who really know craftsmanship, you know, how to do things well. Um, all of those things, those ideas of rescue and, and quality of work and skill and movement and contact with nature, um, those are all in Outward Bound, but they're, you know, they're part of a lifelong career of that educator. 1933, he fled Germany. 1934, started Gordonston with the motto at the top, plus et en vous, more in you. There's more in you than you think. You know, so once again, you know, before the creation of Outward Bound, you know, there's this base of this philosophy you know, that you can be more than you think you can be. You can move beyond those self-imposed limitations. Um, you can do that by traveling into nature with companions and organizing your life as an expedition that's seeking high goals. All of that was there. The county badge scheme in the 1930s, outward bound starting um, at the end of the decade, moving through the 1940s. Um, very, very intense short-term courses that Han wrote about in the 30s. But outward bound began to show that you could do something that's w wonderfully concentrated in a short period of time. You know, at the, as it began with a, with a tremendous admiration of the life under sail, you know, which was being lost in so many ways in the larger world. You know, but the craftsmanship and quality and handiwork and dedication of people working on a team in nature with weather and change and everything that mediates, you know, being in that world. That was kind of the origin story of Outward Bound. I've told it a little bit differently because you tell it around U-boats and things like that, but it was already there. You know, the life and the way of living was already there. Um, moving to the um, formation of the um, United World Colleges, the notion of um, a network of colleges building peace, leaders for peace around the world. You know, really a precursor, I think, of the, the peace building organization we have now. Um, the Duke of Edinburgh Award, the notion that you could um, have a cluster of things that you could do to really become exemplary in fitness and citizenship in a society. So that's, that's kind of a career arc. I'm going to end it, though, with a couple of things about Han late in his career. Came to the U.S. in the 60s. Um, this might interest people from other countries. Imagine, you know, if the old man visited, visited your school, you know, and came in and looked at it, and, you know, what might he say? And he had good things to say, I think also critical things. I mean, I think he loved the, you know, the quality of um, instruction from things I've read, um, the life of the instructors, the, the dedication. Um, he was uh, concerned that um, things were taking place only in the wilderness and, and not in other places where people are. But the little story I want to tell you, um, you know, the kind of looking toward the end of his career, is when he visited Colorado went to Marble and was up in the mountains, had a wonderful visit. There's still memories there when I was working on the book I wrote about the Colorado Outward Bound School, you know, its first 20 year history. Um, there were still memories of Hans, um, you know, time there. But in the 60s, the um, riots broke out in Watts in Los Angeles. And as soon as he heard the radio message, um, he took the, the bus down or was, was taken down and was off to California. And he went into Watts right at the end of the, the riots because he wanted to figure out what are we going to do now. And so you think about that and the dislocations taking place in the world, you know, largest worldwide migration in our history, um, terrorism, economic distress, refugees. Um, you know, Han would be very interested in our schools. He would visit and he'd want to be there, but he might be getting on a plane to go and see where, where can we be. One phrase from that period of his life, it was actually in a memorandum, not in a published article, was, you know, these schools we've created, and this included Gordonston and Salem and Outward Bound and all, these are all doing good work and they should continue. But he said what's also needed now is epic labors of love. You know, there was something on an even larger scale that all of us through our individual contributions in the students we're working with in the cities in the wilderness area were all part of something larger. And you know, as people felt in the confrontation with the Third Reich, 
um, now it's the confrontation everywhere. You can't, you can't center it anywhere. You have to realize that work needs to be done in a larger scale. So that's, that's one narrative. The other narrative I want to give you is just, you know, we go down inside ourselves. You go down inside yourself when you think about the work you're doing and why, why you're doing this work. Why is it important to you? You know, so let's flip back again in time and, and go back into this, this guy Kurt Hahn's life. And there's not enough time to do the whole biography. But he wrote a novel when he was a young man. Very interesting. He didn't become a novelist. Um, it was very important to him, though. He wrote a novel. It was actually it was reviewed by Hermann Hesse, the, the author of Siddhartha and many other things. And so you think that he might have done something different from become an educator, but he decided to become an educator. Um, and in the, in the middle of that novel, novel is there, you know, maybe he might have thought of that as sort of a juvenile project, project later on as he built organizations. But there's a scene in the middle of it where a young man who's sort of a middle school or junior high school student becomes passionate about an idea, something that he thinks is the most important thing he's ever worked on. And he writes an essay about it, and he puts everything into it that he can, just everything, and writes this essay. And he goes into the classroom, and he has this very tough old, old guard school teacher, you know, and um, the, t the type that, um, you know, is not, um, doesn't suffer fools gladly and so forth. And the schoolmaster looks at his essay, and he laughs derisively at him in front of the class and says, I can't believe that you would do this. I'm so ashamed, and he reads a little bit of it and says to the class, you know, this is exactly the wrong way to go. And so that, that scene is so important in this book by Han. Later in the book, he goes outside the city taken by his parents. Um, they, they live out there, and they go on lakes, and he begins hiking, and he becomes happier again. You know, but that scene is the fear that all young people have, and it's the thing that we've all experienced, where something that we really loved and really valued was discarded and treated as ridiculous. And you know, for Han, it was, the, it was the German school system of his day. It was the, um, the gymnasium beyond, beyond the middle school. Um, for us, it might be um, the accountability movement. It might be tests and standards. There might be many things that are telling children, maybe all people, you know, that you're just not good enough. And you have to do it a certain way to, to get to the result. So that, that's an important one. I think another one was a hike. It's in the things you read about Han, you've, you've probably read you know, some essays and, and things about him, that he took a hike with um, some English schoolboys through connections with a family in the Dolomites um, in Italy. And they um, went up and had a beautiful couple of days of hiking. And at the end, they gave him a book, um, which was actually about um, a school in England called Abbotsholm. But it was written backwards, Emma Stolba. And it was by a German educator um, and who was part of the, you know, the new school movement in Germany. And he read that book, which was about, you know, freeing the spirit for learning and about creating a democratic and team community. And I think really began to think about being an educator. So point three from that young Kurt Hahn era is the one that you know, we all hear about, that he had sunstroke, he had periods of time where, you know, after a devastating um, exposure to the sun, would um, have to go into darkness for three or four days, sometimes a week, and recover. And there was one particularly deep, um, I'd say de probably moment of depression, where he developed his vision as an educator. And he came out of that writing about that, about Plato, about Goethe, about the freedom of the individual, about nature. And so that's way, way before Outward Bound. I've just taken three little vignettes but I'm interested in the, the power of the spirit of that educator as he worked over the decades and, and restlessly built these different organizations, you know, including um, persuading Lawrence Holt, the um, president of the Blue Funnel Line, to um, put money down to create Outward Bound. And of course, he gave Lawrence Holt the credit, which is what he did throughout his career. It was always someone else who did that. He was a great fundraiser, to go, to go back to the fundraising conversation. You know, but that, I think that spirit was really lo looking to locate inside the person, you know, what he called the grand passion, the life, the full life that the individual really wants to live, and then channeling that upwards into working with a group and learning to sacrifice for others. 
and, and learning that those demands are part of becoming the great self that you're going to discover. And then at a higher level, learning as you become stronger, as your strength grows, then you engage in higher levels of service and you become more fulfilled. And then you become the citizen that you've always wanted to be and you will become the fulfilled person you want to be. And along the way, there's craftsmanship, there's fitness, um, there's all the kinds of work that's done in different environments, you know, whatever they may be. But that to me is the essence of this man. And I think it's worth remembering that even if we don't, we don't have a catechism. You know, there's not going to be three points we can, we can take down. But um, I go back to that work in understanding him and also in learning about Outward Bound because I think um, this is the most essential work we are doing. And I'm really deeply delighted to be an ally with you in this work. Thank you. All right, let's, let's see if there's other. Maybe we can get some questions. Do we have time? So. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, but I've done something that no one else has done. I've left 10 minutes. <laughs> Mostly people are going right up to the end, and, and that's because this really can be a conversation. You know, what, what is it that, that we need to find out more? What, what are the kinds of things in terms of our core values that animate us and push us forward? You know, what, what should we be doing to, to really make that work um, active? Along with everything else we're talking about, building organizations, raising money, um, planning, uh, communicating, those are all very important. But what, what do we need to do? Yes? Um, um, may I ask, uh, uh, as I know, uh, Kehan is not very outdoor guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got a, but wh what's the reason, as you know, what's the reason bring him to think about bring the young people go really go out is, mm -hmm. is a really need to do. I mean, what's the reason, as you know? Mm -hmm. Because he, his personal is not really outdoor person, mm -hmm. as I know, I, m I mean, read a book. So do you have any thought about that? I mean, I could answer that in terms of his own childhood and, and his life, that uh, growing up in Berlin, his family went to the country, and they went to a place where there were lakes and walks and hikes. And during that period of time, um, be beginning in Germany, there was a movement for young people to go outside, you know, to, to begin expeditioning and camping. So I think he was caught up in that. Um, and I, th you know, as a historian, I think this was a time when you know, the indoor built environment in the late 19th century was really with industrialization and, you know, expansion of cities. People were living indoors much more. And, you know, I think that, that sense that we have, to, we have to continue to be engaged with nature because it's fulfilling, because it's unpredictable, and because it teaches us to be joyful. I think that's something that was in Kurt Hahn. I think his parents gave him that. And he, um, you know, when he, when he went forward, he tried to figure out ways to expand that and increase that. It's even more true now. I mean, the, the kinds of things that Han was talking about, um, the need for locomotion, as he said, um, spectatoritis, I mean, these are words out of the, the Hanian vocabulary. Even more so now, as the built environment has become even more encompassing and technology has intervened to separate people from direct communication, you know, I think those impulses are even more important, but I think it was from his childhood. That would be the basic. Um, so I wonder how you would answer that question that came up this m midday around diversity mm -hmm. and the importance of diversity for Outward Bound. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to see how you explore, respond to that question. It actually is something that, that Han talked about and, and wrote about a little bit. Um, I mean, diversity began with um, socioeconomic diversity, you know, making sure that the, and of course, one of the laws of Salem is, is making sure that people are discovering true natural forms of leadership, you know, not, not the order that exists in the world. Um, but Han also talked about um, creating, um, this was in the early days of Outward Bound, creating Outward Bound schools on frontiers, on borders, in places where cultures interact. And this is something that Lance Lee, um, who's a you know, outward bounder in the United States that many people know, uh, who founded the, the Apprentice Shop in Maine and um, created a worldwide sailing, building wooden boats basically and bringing people together from societies in conflict um, to sail a wooden boat that they had built. And he's often pointed out that, you know, that Han worked on the, 
on the edges, you know, be between peoples, and was always attracted to them. It was no accident that he would want to fly to Watts, you know, where where the racial conflict in the U.S. was was erupting. Um, I think another thing about diversity, though, is um, you know the 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 team that works together, um, and this is also true in our workplaces. It's true in our schools. Um, not only is it increasingly diverse, but the, the human resources that we have are enhanced by diversity. And so being able to operate in an environment where, you know, that you're making full use of the different human potentials, the different passions, the different perspectives, you know, that's essential and, you know, that's truly important for Outward Bound. Um, you know, so I think that's something that's natural to Han. Um, I, I think he would, he would always want to be looking at ways to push outward bound into environments where diversity, you know, is 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 mandatory, where it's really needed, um, where it's not just um, you're doing it because you think you're doing a good thing. It's really it's essential to the work. Um, we've talked a lot today about, and we've talked a lot in this community about evaluation and outcomes. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is. Was Han as strident about evaluation and outcomes on the educational yeah. processes and, and skunk works that he sort of explored and created as we are today? Well, in one sense he was. I mean, if you look back, um, you know, both at Salem and at Gordonston, you know, he created um, unique but powerful report cards, you know, which included things like school subject areas, but they also included what we would now call character um, building traits. Perseverance, you know, would be one, and so um, and they actually not only did they they um, record information about students and talk with the students and their parents, but the students themselves developed what he called a training plan, and training plan was doesn't mean just going out and doing push-ups. It means how you're how you're developing yourself, and how that relates to the you know the goals of the school and and the and this more expanded report card. And if you think about, um, this is outside Outward Bound, but if you, if you go to, to Gordonston, um, there's the path of the silent walk there that goes from the school um, through you know, a mile of forest, ending up in a small unadorned chapel. And so the students there would um, talk with their, their teachers about their performance, and they would, they would take the silent walk and carry, they would have journals, and they would reflect, and they would carry into their lifetime, you know, some self-evaluation they had done. They would also have to take the tests of, you know, the state, you know, and that sort of thing. But I think a kind of evaluation was built in that was was very powerful, and it wasn't the same as something like an end of course impression, which we do frequently. It was really more how are you carrying out the plan that you've created for yourself, you know, to be more than you thought you could be. And I, th I think that's still very important. I would just add, um, we're getting close to seven, but you know, in my day job as a, um, you know, a provost and a dean of a, the largest um, graduate school of education in the United States, largest and oldest, you know, we have 160 faculty and they're, they're studying human development, they're doing evaluation, we have centers, and there's experiential education work there, but many other kinds. And the work of evaluation is really advancing um, rapidly now with much more interesting, you know, sort of deeply grounded ways of understanding um, human performance. I see this in our human development faculty. Um, they're using a theory, for example, called embodied learning, which I'm not gonna, this is be very academic, but the notion of how um, the embodied person acts through experience. So it's not just, um, you know, ticking off a box that I learned something, but what am I actually doing through my lived experience? that carries out the learning that I've created, that's pretty close to Outward Bound. And that's, that's something where you could imagine people coming in and really getting it and not doing something that looks like it's on the outside and separate and, and stupid, basically. So I, I have hope that we're going to be able to do better evaluation. I see my timekeeper here. No, I was just going to take the prerogative of the MC and ask the last question. Oh, yeah. Um, and that is, Tom, if Kurt Hahn was with us today standing in the back of the room, what do you think he would think about the state of Outward Bound today? Oh, I, I think he'd be very proud. I mean, I, I think he would, um, he's someone that, that really believed in, um, you know, the d deep learning of uh, young people and expecting that they really could have transformational learning. And our schools and this group and the people you work with believe that and they're enacting that. 
And I think if we had uh, more instructors in the room, you know, we saw the, you know, the, the bar graph there about how people feel about their instructors, it would be even higher. Um, I think he would also be restless about the conditions in the world in the same way when he went to Watts. And he'd probably be asking us, um, what are we going to do next? You know, what, what is going to be our, our, our epic labors of love, you know, beyond the focused work we're doing? I think he would ask that, um, not knowing that we probably couldn't give an answer immediately, but everything we do channels toward that. I think he would be pleased. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you.